This morning's prayer is by Audette Fulbright Folson. Holy Spirit, God of ages and so many names, we gather once again to rejoice in the light offered to the world by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. His walk on this earth was a gift to generations, and today we give thanks for that gift. We know that we are called together today not simply to rejoice and be glad that such a man was given to us for a time, but rather to heed the calls he made to us. The same calls that reverberate now as they did when he was alive. The same calls you have made time and again in a voice of justice that calls to us throughout the ages. We are called to hear that same word of truth that Dr. King spoke that the hungry and the poor are with us still. It is not enough to march and remember. The work we are called to do is to feed hungry children and to wipe the tears from our siblings' eyes. It is not enough to sing a joyful song. We must also build the houses that will give shelter to every adult and child and allow them full security and dignity. We are called today to remember that we are not to judge one another by the color of our skins, but by the content of our character. In a world where our families are knit ever more tightly together past old ideas of color and race, we know that the tyranny of fear and hatred still exists in our hearts. We know that racism still lurks like a viper around unexpected corners. And so we gather again to renew our promise to one another that we will be vigilant. We will be warriors and peacemakers of a new world, a world that is always dawning. Holy Spirit, on this day of remembrance, we do give thanks, and we are joyful that for a time we had our brother, our pastor and leader, Dr. King, with us. But we do not forget that the mantle he wore for a time has been passed now to us, to each of us gathered here, and it is in our efforts, in our faithful struggle, and in our generous witness to a better world becoming that we make our most powerful prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, gracious one, for this day and for all our many gifts. In a spirit of remembrance and a spirit of gratitude and hope, we set forth once again with your guidance and strength to make the world anew. Amen. Our reading this morning is Turning to One Another by Margaret Wheatley. There is no power greater than a community discovering what it cares about. Ask what's possible, not what's wrong. Keep asking. Notice what you care about. Assume that many others share your dreams. Be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. Talk to people you know. Talk to people you don't know. Talk to people you never talk to. Be intrigued by the differences you hear. Expect to be surprised. Treasure curiosity more than certainty. Invite in everybody who cares to work on what's possible. 
acknowledge that everyone is an expert about something. Know that creative solutions come from new connections. Remember, you don't have to fear people whose story you know. Real listening always brings people closer together. Trust that meaningful conversations can change your world. Rely on human goodness. Stay together. Okay, so show of hands, no wrong answers, so don't worry. And I want you to be honest. So you don't need to look at other people's hands around you, just your own. Who here has heard of Gandhi? Who here has heard of Martin Luther King Jr.? Who here has heard of Rosa Parks? Who here has heard of Claudette Colvin? Who here has heard of Ella Baker? Who here has heard of Bindu Amini? Who here has heard of Kanaka Durga? Okay, good. This gives me an idea of where we are. So this morning I want to start with Gandhi and work my way to Kanaka Durga. And as I do so, I want you to hold in your mind the image of a web. A spider's web of connections linking people to each other around the world and throughout time. And this web is vast. But it also connects people more directly. It connects people sitting next to each other, standing next to each other, marching together, linking arms. Do you have that image? Okay, so now let's go back in time a little bit to 1869 when Mohandas Gandhi was born in India. He was born into a well-respected family and at the age of 18 traveled to England to train as a lawyer. But when he came back to India, he couldn't find a job. So in 1893, he accepted a contract to do legal work for an Indian firm in South Africa, which is where our last song originated. Now his plan was to stay for one year, but he ended up staying in South Africa for 21 years. And it was there that Gandhi was first exposed to real racial prejudice and where he developed his philosophy of nonviolent direct action by organizing the Indian community there to oppose race-based laws and oppression. Gandhi returned to India in 1914, where the British were still in charge. And in 1919, when British authorities issued something called the Rowlatt Acts, which permitted Indians to be jailed without trial by the British, Gandhi called for a day of national fasting, striking, and meeting. He called it an act of satyagraha, which translates to truth force or love force a form of nonviolent resistance. Within the next few years, Gandhi had mobilized a mass movement promoting Indian self-rule through a boycott of British goods and institutions. And this led to the arrests of thousands of satyagrahis. And in 1922, Gandhi himself was arrested and served two years in prison for sedition, which means inciting rebellion. And this was not his last time in prison, but every time he got out, he resumed his organizing. One year, in 1930, Gandhi and 80 volunteers began a 200-mile march to the sea where they defied British law by producing their own salt from the seawater. 
And this made the British really mad because their British salt laws had ensured that the British government would get taxes for the sale of salt. So they didn't want the Indian people making their own. And eventually over 60,000 Indians were imprisoned for making salt. And a year later, they were successful in changing their laws through that civil disobedience. Gandhi continued the Satyagraha movement to protest against having an untouchables class of people in India, and also against British rule. Until finally, in 1947, discrimination against the untouchables was made illegal and Britain transferred power to India and Pakistan. Okay, so Martin Luther King Jr. was born in 1929, and he first learned about Gandhi during his studies at Crozer Theological Seminary. In 1950, King heard Mordecai Johnson, president of Howard University, speak of his recent trip to India and Gandhi's nonviolent resistance techniques. King wrote, Christ showed us the way, and Gandhi in India showed it could work. He argued that Gandhi's philosophy was the only morally and practically sound method open to oppressed people in their struggle for freedom. So King became the face of the nonviolent resistance to racism in the United States, the American Satyagraha. But it only worked, it only had any impact because hundreds of thousands of people joined him in that resistance. Like the 60,000 people imprisoned for making salt, African Americans and others put their bodies on the line, getting beaten and getting arrested in order to move our society inch by inch toward justice. So King was a big name and a charismatic leader, but he was not doing this work alone. So this day, this weekend, we have honoring him, really has to be shared with so many other people. It has to be shared with Rosa Parks. One of my favorite poets, Nikki Giovanni, wrote a poem called Rosa Parks. Here's part of it. And this is about Rosa Parks, whose feet were not so tired. It had been, after all, an ordinary day until the bus driver gave her the opportunity to make history. This is about Mrs. Rosa Parks from Tuskegee, Alabama, who was also the field secretary of the NAACP. This is about the moment Rosa Parks shouldered her cross, put her worldly goods aside, was willing to sacrifice her life so that that young man in Money, Mississippi, who had been so well protected by the Pullman porters, would not have died in vain. When Mrs. Park said no, a passionate movement was begun. No longer would there be a reliance on the law. There was a higher law. When Mrs. Parks brought that light of hers to expose the evil of the system, the sun came and rested on her shoulders, bringing the heat and the light of truth. Others would follow Mrs. Parks. Four young men in Greensboro, North Carolina would also say no. Great voices would be raised singing the praises of God and exhorting us to forgive those who trespass against us. But it was the Pullman Porters who safely got Emmett to his granduncle and it was Mrs. Rosa Parks who could not stand that death and in not being able to stand it, she sat back down. No. When I asked if you had heard of Rosa Parks, I'd say almost all of you raised your hands. But then when I asked you about Claudette Colvin, not as many did. So I want to tell you about her too. Because Rosa Parks was not the only person who refused to give up her seat on a bus. 
Claudette Colvin, a 15-year-old from Montgomery, also refused to give her seat to a white woman on a crowded, segregated bus. And this was a few months before Rosa Parks. Claudette Colvin was among the five plaintiffs originally included in the federal court case challenging bus segregation in Montgomery. She testified before the United States District Court, and the judges determined that the state and local laws requiring bus segregation in Alabama were unconstitutional. So the case went to the United States Supreme Court, and again, Claudette Colvin testified, and the court upheld the ruling, and the Montgomery bus boycott finally came to an end. So why have we heard of Rosa Parks and not Claudette Colvin? It's because she was an unmarried pregnant teenager and the civil rights leaders at the time did not want an unmarried pregnant teenager to be the face of the movement. But today, this weekend honoring Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. should be shared too with Claudette Colvin, who also put her body on the line and who testified before the Supreme Court and who is also part of that inescapable network of mutuality, that web of connections drawing us all together. And I want us to think about why it is that we feel the need to choose perfect people to be the test case for justice. Aren't those of us who are imperfect also deserving? We still do that today. We aren't ready to stand up and put our bodies on the line for a teenage boy who stole something and then was killed because he stole something. But that teenager is also deserving of justice. And that teenager is also part of the web. But back to the 1950s. Who do you think got the Montgomery bus boycott organized and got the word out and got neighbor to convince neighbor to walk to work instead of taking the bus? It wasn't Martin Luther King who went door to door to every house. He was out there preaching, but it was the organizers behind the scenes who did the groundwork. It was the behind the scenes people. It was the women like Ella Baker. Not all of you knew who Ella Baker was, but this day honors her too. Because Ella Baker not only organized nonviolent resistance, she taught others how to organize. She was one of two adult advisors for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, the group responsible for voter registration drives, sit ins, and freedom rides all over the South. She taught them how to organize, how to bring their hopes and dreams together and find ways to articulate them to other people. She taught them how to make phone calls, go knocking on doors, keep lists of supporters, and teach other people how to do the same. You might not know Ella Baker's name, but you might know some of her words from the songs we sing. She said, until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons, becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of a white mother's son, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. She said, give light and people will find the way. So now I want to follow the strands of that web back to India and through to today, all the way across the oceans to Bindu Amini and Kanaka Durga. You see, in India today, women are organizing. Women are talking to each other about how to stand up for gender equality. 
There was a law in place until just this fall, September 2018, that banned women of menstruating age from entering some of the country's sacred Hindu temples. But these two women, Bindu Amini and Kanaka Durga, who are in their 40s, did enter the Sabaramala temple and offered prayers to the deity Lord Ayapa, who is known to be celibate. It is this celibacy that is cited by the Hindu traditionalists as the reason women under 50 should not enter the temple. The fear is that the women could tempt the deity. And the country exploded, protests everywhere against these women. And of course it's not just about the right to enter the temple. It's about everything that represents and all the ways women are not treated fairly in Indian society. And so in the midst of this country in crisis about women's access to this temple, the women began organizing. And they decided that they wanted to make a statement, a visual statement of solidarity with one another and the struggle for gender equality. And there's a road in India called National Highway 66. And it stretches all along the country's western coast. And on New Year's Day, women decided to gather all along this road to make a chain of women, a women's wall, to demonstrate for gender equality. I want you to think about this for a minute. Think about the organizing that it took. So I'm up here alone, and I'm feeling like I want some of you to join me in solidarity. So I'm going to think about who I might have some influence on, who uh, might trust me enough to do something brave like get up here in front of a room full of people looking at you. So I'm thinking about that and I feel like maybe my worship committee would be willing to join me. Is this true? Worship committee, would you join me and stretch across the front of this room? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you being up here with me. Do any of you have like a spouse or a best friend who's here today that you could convince? Anyone you have a little connection to out there that you could get to come up and join us? Make eye contact with that person. All right. Thank you. Thank you. This is good. This is turning into something. I have a spouse. <laughs> you, you're responding to Shar? All right. Yeah. All right. This is good. I actually have a specific request now for the back row. And I know Bruce has a lot of clout in this community. Bruce, you don't have to come up here, but can you organize the people in the back to make a line across the back? You might have to say please. Use your influence to get some people to line up along the back and stand. Dan, you're a friend of mine and this is important to me. Would you be willing to stand? Cal, would you be willing? Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay. This is good. You can stretch across so we have like a line up here and a line there. But you know, now that you see that this is kind of turning into something, would you all be willing to participate? Could you join us and make a big circle? This is going to be great. If you all were part of it, it would be even better. If we could make a big circle all along the outside of the meeting house. Look at this. Oh, cricket, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> Brenda, I'm so glad you're here. Wow. Look at this. This is amazing. You feel that web of connection linking us all to each other? I really wonder 
<laughs> what it would be like if we tried to get all of Provincetown to do this one day? What if we lined up all along Commercial Street and called everyone we knew? We could stretch from the West End all the way down to the East End. That would be cool. You could all call people you know. But why stop there? What if one day we decided to move our line from Commercial Street over to Route 6 and we try to get the people in Toronto involved and wealthy all along Route 6? That would be so amazing. I wonder how many people that would take. What if we decided, okay, this is getting exciting, what if we decided we wanted to stretch all the way to the Sagamore Bridge, 62 miles? Can you imagine how many people that would take? How many phone calls that would take? I feel like we could do it though. Well, you know what? The women in India did it. And they didn't just stretch 62 miles though. They stretched 400 miles. And do you know how many women that took? It took almost five million women. And they did it. They did it on New Year's Day. You can look up pictures online. It's pretty amazing. You know, Dr. King said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability. It takes continuous struggle. It takes continuous struggle and it takes organizing. And it takes this web of connections that we have to one another. And I am thankful for this web of connections in this room today and how powerful it is. But I'm also so thankful for the image of five million women in India stretching as far as the eye can see and then even further. And that is how change happens. When we feel that web of connections to each other and we reach through those connections, through those strands to make our dreams into a reality and make change possible. So we can do it here, and we can do it all over the world. May it be so. Amen. And before you come back to your seats, would you indulge me and do our final hymn from where you are? There's copies of our final hymn all along the outskirts of the sanctuary. It's called Circle Round for Freedom. And we're going to sing it through twice. First Brenda's going to play it for us and then we're going to sing it through twice.
Please join hands for our closing words. You can do elbows. Change requires talking to people we don't know yet. I invite everybody after the service today to talk to one person you don't know, someone you haven't talked to before. I know some of us are introverts and some of us are shy. Today I'm giving you permission to step out of that and say hello to someone. Tell each other your names. Ask each other about your hopes and dreams for this world. This is a chance to practice the power of love and truth and to remember that the most radical thing you can do in this world is to introduce people to each other. Go in peace.